the Eureka Symphony, Beethoven, was a big inspiration as a string player to me. And because I was bowled over when I heard it, and to be able to play it at an early age, it was just something I'll never forget. And it's made me wonder uh, how he conceived it. You know, I, you know, I like to think that he woke up one day, turned over and said, okay, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna write something right here. And then everything else came. You know, because I think he was such a, uh, master of rhythm, you know, and was able to use that to create all of his colors and stuff. So, yeah, Beethoven. And there's another one too. There's, oh, oh maybe I should wait to tell you that one. You can do it on the yeah. second round. Okay, I'll do it on the second right. round. Okay. Um, when you've been in particular performing situations um, and things have gone, are going extremely well, like you are such in groove and every, you know, it seems like everybody's relating so well um, on stage. And so therefore, the particular rendering of the piece is something different. How does that feel in the body when that is happening? And this has to do with your own particular playing, like, you know, that, that surprise of, wow. Yeah. You feel happy, and you feel uh, relaxed, and you feel, uh, you feel like you've um, shed everything of everyday life, and you're just... In the present, you're in that moment, and uh, you're swinging. It's like you're swinging, and it's you know you're smiling and you, and you're appreciating not only what you add to it, but what everybody else is doing. And I think when that gets to that point, everybody's enjoying themselves. Uh, you know, music is a reflection of the human condition, and it's a reflection of. Most importantly to me, a reflection of leadership in morality, in education, in discipline, in responsibility, because music leads you to, I think, a freedom. And freedom comes with responsibilities. So I've been in the room with certain artists who I consider totally free when they're performing. And, you know, I think about, as I'm watching, I think about what is it that has gotten them this far? So, especially my father, and playing with him and traveling with him, and watching what goes on before and after performance. And in the moment when he's performing, he's in the present stripped of whatever burdens we all have. Artists are stripped of their burdens and they just soar in that moment because they have studied, they've mastered their instruments, and they can just do it. And that's, that's what I mean, that to be able to be free like that comes with the responsibility of studying your craft. So. So I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that, actually, and um, if you would name your father, because people will not know. My father's Max Roach, drummer. He was a drummer, famous drummer. And so then, just speak a little bit more about this responsibility and how you saw that in your father, and how that was exemplified in your father, and then what it's meant to you. Well, I think great artists, uh, and I think my father is one, you know, start at an early age. There's something there that is driven, 
very passionate at an early age. So, you know, they master uh, that inanimate object at an early age, and then they're able to use the, that tool to climb this ladder to freedom, you know, and to creativity. And I think that, you know, part of the creative process for artists is to, you know, study what, what came before so you can create something new, you know. And I think that's, a, that's something that is a, a driving force and, and, and creative people, you know. But you have to know what's come before in order to create something that's new. I went to see, my first Broadway show was Man of La Mancha when I was in high school, and that was very impactful because it spoke to, um, I love the music, but it also spoke to what we strive for as human beings. Uh, the morality, you know, the love. And uh, I just found that very inspirational. And I, and I found looking at it on stage and looking at the pit, it was just something I'll never forget. And I said to myself, I want to do that one day. I was just going to ask you, could you imagine yourself doing that? You played the viola at that point, correct? Yeah, I was in high school, yeah. And I said I wanted to do that one day. So. And you did. I did. <laughs> and so, talk a little bit more about performing, and maybe be specific in one, if you can think back, I mean, for me it's hard to, but think back about one performance where you personally were feeling that this flow was there and that, you know, this the parts were, were greater than, the sum was greater than the parts, and can you tell us, like, did your critical mind go away? Like, how? Tell us more. I want. I want to hear so much more. Well, I there were a couple of there were things that I felt really uh, uh, very present in uh, <clears throat> in different areas that I've performed in um, Broadway. Uh, La Boheme. When La Boheme was on Broadway and having. Uh, the opportunity to play that in a chamber music kind of setting was really, really, really wonderful. And I looked forward to playing it uh, every night and having Constantine Kitsopoulos conduct. It was just really inspiring. It was very inspiring. And Baz Luhrmann's vision of the whole stage was just, you know, very creative, very new. Um, the other one is the Uptown String Quartet, my, my string quartet, and uh, having many moments when we really clicked and uh, feeling that excitement when everyone's on the same page and, uh, and very present. Uh, those are two things I remember. Why did you form that string quartet? I didn't form that string quartet. My father formed that string quartet. He was visiting his mother, my grandmother, one day while I was in college. And uh, she said to him, Max, you played with Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, Duke Ellington. When are you going to play with your daughter? So I was like, you know, so. He actually came out to Oberlin College where I was at school and uh, told me about the idea. And uh, I was um, scared to death, actually, like I'm not a improvising musician. But his whole vision was really uh, very creative. So I um, got on board. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> what a privilege. Yeah, it was, you know, and to travel with him and to watch him play and to really understand, uh, you know, his composition skills on the, on the drums, you know. He played theme and variations and he was a great chamber music player. He could complement and support 
you know, uh, he was a soloist. Um, and, and at some point, my very, to me, very important creative imperative was to honor him with an arrangement of one of his drum solos with the string quartet. I figured that would be something different, you know. And uh, he was very famous for doing, uh, he called them drum inventions. But they were short drum solos. And I picked one and uh, I actually transcribed it and uh, added some improvisation to it and uh, in honor of, of him because I figure, you know, people make arrangements of a Duke Ellington or a Cole Porter tune, so why can't I do Max Roach? And so, and you could do Max Roach because he was a very melodic drummer. Yes, I remember the, the first performance of um, my arrangement of one of my father's Max Roach's uh, drum solos, and it, and it was at the uh, Blue Note Jazz Club in the village. <laughs> you know, and people were like, they couldn't believe it. And it was interesting because he played his, he played it first to introduce us. He played it. Of course, he played it differently from what I did, and for whatever he did before, he played it. And then we played it, and it was just, you know, people really dug it, so. I'm curious, do people play that now, string quartets? No, it's not published. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a very percussive piece, you know, and you have to, uh, you have to really understand what it is, else, you know, some, some, some people are like, some string players are like, you know, I play like this, I don't play like this. Yeah, so it's hard to adjust, but you know, we did it. We did it for a while. I actually got nominated for a Grammy behind that piece. Wow! Who knows? This is crazy. That's so, crazy. It was. It was. It was a real inspiration for me because it was a real um, work of love, you know, and respect for this great musician. My father. Well, music, uh, 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 for me, music, but the arts are disciplines that are inclusive of different types of people all over the world. And <clears throat> that's important for all of us as human beings uh, so we don't... Um, so, so, so we're equal, you know, because once that thing comes together where you're in a group of uh, musicians who are from different walks of life, different races, uh, from different parts of the world, and you're there uh, being inclusive and, 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 and understanding and interpreting a piece of music together, it strips away so much hate and struggle. And at least at one point you understand, you know, that the essential things about passion, love, and drive, or struggle, is universal, you know. And um, that's why it's important, the arts are important, and, and we can be leaders, you know, uh, and, and, and uh, there have been wonderful leaders uh, who have, have had a big impact on society. And I think you read into it, you know, art, uh, music lets, allows you to be expressive, allows you to uh, let it flow from you. What is your passion, what concerns you, what makes you angry, what makes you happy, what makes you sad, you know. And those things, if done in an inclusive way, will bring people in, no matter who they are. My junior high school teacher inspired me greatly as a viola player. 
I started playing the viola in seventh grade. He was my orchestra teacher, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. And he was very supportive of me. And uh, during my seventh year in, in junior high school, he introduced me to his father, who was a viola teacher, who was a professional. He actually worked on Broadway. I studied with him for six years through junior high school and high school. There was a moment in ninth grade when I was going to um, a junior high school in a black neighborhood in Brooklyn. Mr. Hirsch came to me and said, I am transferring to Midwood High School. And at that time, Midwood was one of the best schools in the city. And he says, I'm taking your records from the principal's office and don't tell anybody, just show up at Midwood High School. And I really think that if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be playing the viola. That was very, very impactful, you know? And it just made me believe even more that it takes a village to really get someone to rise. And uh, it's important. I think that that kind of support and passion and uh, morality and inclusiveness uh, is something that we, we should strive for. You know, and I've always tried to strive for that. I've always tried to see it. I've always tried to understand it because of that particular moment. It was so uh, compassionate. I've thought about this in, in terms of the creative imperative. And I, <clears throat> I tend to think that when I'm in a classical situation, I'm more of a musician who interprets, you know, instead of creating. You know, so I don't, I don't see myself as creating when I'm in a classical situation. I try to be the best interpreter I can be according to what the conductor is doing, because it's really what he wants or she wants, you know. Um, there are moments that I really enjoyed. I enjoyed playing with the Joffrey Ballet. I enjoyed playing with Nasty Apollo or Alvin Ailey. I enjoyed those things, you know. Orchestra concerts. I enjoyed, I think, the most exciting uh, uh, orchestra concerts for me was when I was first starting. You know, I played with All City High School, and that was like, that was really exciting. You know, everyone was like fresh and hopeful, and it was wonderful. Yeah. So, speaking of that fresh and hopeful person, and speaking of the creative imperative, I use the expression more globally than just being a literally a creator. And can you tell me, uh, can you remember the point or the year or whatever where you said, this is it, like this is it, and there is nothing else? Like, I don't want to be a teacher. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be a lawyer. I don't want to be a dentist or whatever the hell it is that many parents would actually sort of, maybe not your parents, but mm -hmm. most parents might feel more comfortable with their children going into some kind of profession that is more, you know, uh, more assurance of making a, tr a living at it, essentially, to be, to be honest. So can you tell us, you know, when you thought that, and were you conscious of thinking of it? I put words in your mouth. I don't know. I was conscious in high school. I wanted to play the viola. I wanted to be a musician. In fact, I wanted to be a musician before then because I used to play the guitar uh, before I played the viola. And I would sit and, you know, listen to, you know, folk music then, Bob Dylan and Eric Anderson. And, I mean, just, it was inspiring to listen to that music. You know, and so I've always, I've always wanted to be a musician. Can you remember back then what being a musician gave you as that young girl? 
what was it that, like, I got to get me some of that? I think for me as a black woman, as a black young girl, uh, faced with um, some challenges growing up in a black neighborhood, you, you, you tend to see the arts as a, 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 an escape from, from certain things. You know, not only that, but you listen to black artists who are inspiring, you know, and how music has, has lifted them up, you know. So there's that part of it, I think, for me as a black person. It's like, you know, you do something that's impactful for other people who are struggling, you know, and you do it in a way that's attractive and inclusive. The music is... Is, is that and not only that, but you know, as a, as you know, coming up during the civil rights movement, or um, especially Vietnam, you know, listening to a lot of folk music and the protest music, and it was all good, you know, great musicians, but they had a message, you know, and that was at the time very very impactful for people who struggle, you know. I do, you know, I feel that. Um, I have to step up. You know, it's not about playing the viola anymore. And it is about playing the viola. It's about, it's not about playing the drums, but it is about playing the drums uh, or any instrument because playing an instrument, learning how to paint, learning how to dance, uh, learning how to sing are tools that require critical thinking. In the digital world we have now and the drive to dummy down education in this country, critical thinking is not appreciated anymore. When you can just go to Google and get your answers by just clicking something or if you grow up not hearing or seeing an artist play the violin or the cello and be able to say he's a great athlete or listening to an opera singer and saying he or she is a great athlete as well as an artist and you're listening to just a keyboard playing music, I, you know, it's scary to me. It separates people. Uh, I have a passion for different kinds of music because I grew up in a family that was in that a black family, uh, and you usually have to take in other cultures. Other cultures really don't take you in, but you take in other cultures, so we're kind of used to that. Um, the Uptown String Quartet was four black women and who studied classically. We took in that culture and appreciated that culture. <clears throat> so, you can appreciate the discipline and the work put into art. It's changed because there's no more, which is very important to me, music appreciation. But these kids aren't exposed to uh, the appreciation of music or the appreciation of art or any of the arts. Uh, and it's scary to me because it separates people and I'm passionate about uh, listening to other types of music. As a matter of fact, I'm listening to a lot of flamenco music now, gypsy music, which is really like something I can identify with because these people are, uh, they have no home and they yearn. They yearn for it and their music shows it and there's such a structure 
And then within that structure, they, uh, 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 the present artists are, 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 are making it new within that structure. And that, to me, is exceptional uh, art and something that's uh, very inspiring. Like it was in Beethoven's day, you know. He knew, he worked within the framework, but he, he broke through, you know. And that's inspiring. Children are not learning like that anymore. That, that answers your question. I mean, I tend to... Uh... No, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's great. That's, that, I think we're good.